Välkomna tillbaka. Nu kommer ytterligare ett mycket intressant bolag, Sedana Medical, presenterats av vd Johannes Stoll. Please, Johannes, uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our short uh, company presentation of Sedana Medical. If you have not come across us, we are a Stockholm-based medical device and pharmaceutical company, uh, roughly 100 colleagues, and all of us get up in the morning for just one purpose, uh, which is to make inhaled sedation, uh, the standard of, uh, of doing sedation in the intensive care units around the, around the world. So we have a full company focused on, uh, on only one thing. I will talk much more about what that means and how that works, uh, but essentially we're doing inhaled sedation with a combination of a medical device, Sedaconda ACD, which is the black little device that you see on the picture here, and also with our proprietary drug, a volatile anesthetic uh, called Sedaconda isoflurane. Let's talk about uh, the patients here. Um, if you look at the world, there's around about 30 million patients in the world every year that need care in an intensive care unit. And a little less than half of these patients need to be mechanically ventilated. Uh, that means that they can't breathe by themselves, but they need a machine helping them breathe for them. And that can have many different reasons. Um, and nowadays, of course, most people's mind jumps to COVID-19 right away, but that is only one of the possible reasons. Could be that the patient had an accident, a surgery, pneumonia, multiple organ failure. So there's a whole list of reasons why you can't breathe yourself. And if you are in that situation, then the majority of these patients, roughly 8 million in the, in the world, need to be sedated. Uh, because this is a very stressful situation. You're in the ICU, you have a tube down your throat, you have a, a machine forcing uh, air into your, into your lungs. There's a lot of anxiety involved. Uh, a lot of patients are in pain also. So the majority needs, uh, needs sedation. Uh, and if you look at these eight million patients uh, a year and you run the numbers, you get to a theoretical market potential for us of, of two to three billion euros. And that number is, is growing just with demographics, roughly 5% a year. And what Medi uh, Sedana Medical is here uh, to change is the way that sedation is done. Uh, so for several decades, the standard of care was intravenous sedation. So typically needle in your arm and you get propofol. Propofol works from a pure sedation uh, perspective, but it comes with uh, some really important drawbacks, uh, which is that uh, propofol accumulates in the body, which uh, is, is, an, is a problem, for example, for patients that have problems with their liver and their, and their kidneys, which, of course, many intensive care uh, patients do, that, uh, do have that. And you will see that patients take a long time to wake up. They take a long time to, uh, to recover. And when they wake up, they often have neurological problems like delirium, hallucinations, being very unoriented. And there's also something called propofol infusion syndrome, which is quite rare, but if it occurs, it's very often fatal. And the big advantage of doing the sedation with a gas uh, that we are bringing, inhaled sedation, and we've also shown that in, in, in clinical trials, is that uh, the drug does not accumulate in the body. You breathe in and you breathe out, uh, and as a, as a consequence of that, uh, you will see uh, that these patients wake up faster, uh, they need less opioids without having more, more pain, and they also you will see more spontaneous breathing, which is important for the, for the time after the ventilator. Uh, just to give you a rough idea of what we're talking about, so our main device is the Sedaconda ACD, uh, a little filter that is inserted in the existing uh, breathing infrastructure of, of the existing ventilator, so you don't need to invest into any capital equipment, it's just a 24-hour disposable. The way it works, uh, there's a little evaporator in there, uh, the liquid gas goes into the device, it gets turned into a gas and starts sedating the patient. And then when the patient uh, breathes out, 90% of that gas will be captured by the uh, device and goes back into the patient um, uh, next time they breathe in, which is a very efficient uh, system, uh, for example, compared to the operating theater where very often everything the patient that uh, breathes out gets sucked into a wall and, and often goes into the atmosphere. Uh, we are in a quite interesting situation because the device part of our therapy has been around for a while. The device has been approved in many countries. We've, we are selling it in, in, in 40 countries. But the drug part uh, has been off-label. Uh, so we are now the first company that, uh, that has approved isoflurane for use in the ICU, uh, which now makes us the first and the only solution for inhaled sedation in the intensive care unit. Um, and despite that off-label uh, status or previous off-label status, we are, we're seeing some good traction already. Our main market is Germany, uh, where you have around about 1,600 intensive care units. More than half of those are already our customers, and to a smaller extent, but still we, we are selling the, uh, the, the product in more than 40 countries. 
quick look at uh, uh, the quarterly report that we just uh, uh, published uh, a few days back. Um, we've had both the best quarter and the best full year of, of our history. If you look at this chart, the growth rate of the quarter versus the previous year uh, looks probably a bit modest. Uh, we had 2% in, in, in local currencies, 1% in reported numbers. Uh, but keep in mind that the comparator here, 2020, was an exceptional quarter because this was the first winter in, uh, in, in COVID. Uh, so a lot of customers did not know what to expect. And we had a lot of stock building. Uh, so there were rumors in many countries that propofol was going to run out. Uh, so they basically bought whatever they could get their hands on to sedate their patients. Um, and we, we managed, uh, without that same stock building effect, we managed to get to the same level um, again in 21, which is a very good, uh, good result that we're very happy about. If you look by region, our main market is uh, Germany, as I already said. Uh, they've delivered strong growth both for the quarter and for the, for the year. The other direct markets, so these are markets where we have our own field teams. This is the UK, France, Spain, Nordics, and, uh, and the Benelux countries. We've had an interest interesting year because they were hurt quite a lot in the first two quarters by that stock building I was talking about. So customers were still working through that inventory that had built up. So we were chasing a gap uh, for, the, for the full year. Uh, and I'm quite happy to see that we're now back to the high 2021, uh, 2020 levels in, 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 in 21. So we've been able to close that gap and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to uh, seeing continued growth momentum here as well. Then we have a bunch of markets uh, that, we are, that we call the distributor markets where we're not selling directly, uh, but working with partners. Very strong year, almost doubled, uh, doubled the sales. Uh, the fourth quarter looks uh, weak compared to the, uh, compared to the, uh, the previous year. Uh, the reason for that is that a big part of that business is in Latin America. Uh, and as I already mentioned, in, in Latin America was one of the regions where propofol ran out uh, in, that, in that quarter. So we had a very artificially high uh, comparator here. On the operational side, we have two big priorities for the company. Of course, to execute a successful launch uh, now that the therapy is approved in, in, in Europe, but already now preparing for what one day will be our largest market, uh, the United States. On the European side, um, we got approval on the European level uh, last summer. Uh, and the way it works, it's a decentralized procedure. Then it gets passed on to the individual countries to, to grant national approvals. We have uh, gotten these national approvals in 14 out of 15 countries to date uh, that were included in the, in the application. The one we are still waiting for is Poland. Uh, that seemed to be taking a bit of time. And there's a couple of countries um, where we have a separate process, UK because of Brexit, Switzerland because, uh, because they're not in the EU, and Italy because we're on a, on a slightly different path there. All of these are uh, submitted for marketing uh, authorization, and we're expecting these approvals during the year. We've had a very, very important milestone for our company uh, in February. Uh, so that just happened as we shipped the first bottles of Sedaconda isoflurane, so our proprietary drug, uh, to, uh, to hospitals in, in, uh, in Germany. So now we have moved from a company aspiring uh, to deliver the first and only on-label therapy uh, for inhaled sedation to actual patients benefiting from our, from our therapy, which of course is very, uh, very exciting. Now, um, the question I get a lot, so what does that mean now? What can we expect in terms of uh, sales ramp up? Uh, what I've tried to be quite clear about in the, in the quarterly report is, of course, now that we are the only ones that are approved, we have a big ambition of converting most of what's today off-label to, uh, to, to on-label. Uh, but I'm expecting a more gradual uh, ramp up as opposed to a straight, line, um, a straight line up. The reason for that is that we don't launch in all countries at the same time. Uh, some countries need to go through a local pricing and reimbursement process first, so it will be a bit of a staggered uh, launch. But also every account, uh, it takes some time until you get them switched, uh, because you need to convince the ICU staff, you need to convince the pharmacists that it's worth paying a premium over the generics. Uh, sometimes you have purchasing organizations involved, sometimes you have a schedule with the uh, formulary committee meetings that you can't influence. So it does not happen overnight, but of course we are, we are, we are working on uh, uh, gradually uh, transferring, transferring that market to our products. We had a very good milestone in January with NICE in the UK issuing a recommendation for Sedaconda ACD. Uh, and if you know NICE, they don't uh, um, issue recommendations lightly. So that's a big, big success. And not only that, they also confirmed that there's a significant cost saving with our products compared to intravenous sedation. So if you look at one patient over a 30-day period, 
uh, you will see that a patient on inhaled sedation will save the system 3,800 pounds uh, compared to somebody on, on, in, on intravenous sedation. And the main reason for that is that these patients in that analysis left uh, the ICU uh, a few days earlier than, than intravenous uh, sedation patients. And, of course, that's fantastic for the UK, uh, but NICE is one of these institutions that gets a lot of recognition also beyond, beyond the UK. And that puts us in a very strong position now because we can not only talk about the clinical benefits that we've shown in our clinical trial, SET001, with more than 300 patients. So these were the things I mentioned, less opioid requirements, more spontaneous breathing, um, uh, shorter, more predictable wake-up times. But now we can also talk about the, the savings that the hospitals will, will, will realize and the health economic uh, benefits. If we switch gears and look at the United States, uh, we've taken a, a, an important decision in the, in the fall, uh, very briefly after I joined the, 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 the company, which is to build up our own commercial operations in the United States. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, there's no doubt that the potential in the US is by far the largest of any individual market. So if I compare to our today's main market, Germany, you have five times the number of ICU beds, uh, but also from a price level perspective, if you compare Propofol, which is used for intravenous sedation, and a good reference, uh, the net price level, so what, what hospitals actually pay, uh, is, is three times higher than, uh, than, than, than what we see in Europe. So there's no doubt about the market potential, but at the same time, we're also looking at a target audience that's quite manageable, even for a company our, our size, uh, because there's less than 5,000 hospitals in the US that actually do have ICU care, uh, and that you co can cover with a field team uh, size that we can, we can afford from an investment uh, investment uh, perspective. Now that decision does not mean that we will never look at complementary partnerships if something comes along and we feel like we can add more value by somebody helping us broadening the reach even more or get getting us access to hospitals we otherwise wouldn't get access to. But I think strategically it's very important for us to have our destiny in our own hands and are, are, are able uh, to pull through with, the, with this strategy and we further strengthened our financial position after the capital raise in, in, in the fall, uh, which gives us now the flexibility to also implement this strategy. Um, important milestone uh, also on the uh, regulatory uh, process that is running in the, in, in the US. We got the IND approved uh, by the FDA just before Christmas, uh, so a nice, nice Christmas present, uh, which now means that we can start our clinical program that we have aligned with uh, the FDA. Uh, it's a study with 500 um, uh, patients, essentially the same setup, same endpoints uh, as we have uh, already successfully run in, in Europe. But of course, FDA wants to see that this works in, in, in US patients. Uh, and we are, we are fully on track here after the IND. Um, we are working in, in setting up the sites, getting them trained and are expecting the first patients in the, in the clinic in April. Uh, we've also given the trial a name now, INSPIRE ICU, which stands for Inhaled Sedation versus Propofol in Respiratory Failure. Just looking at the timelines very briefly, as I said, we are, we're expecting the first patients in the clinic in April. And then, of course, it depends a bit on how fast we can recruit patients. If we can meet our ambitious timelines, uh, then we can hopefully finalize that trial uh, during the year of 23, which would then mean that we can put the NDA uh, into the FDA early, early 24. Um, it is a 10-month review process, and if that goes well, uh, we're looking at a potential approval in the end of uh, 24 and probably a launch in early 25. So that's the timeline we are working against. Uh, very clearly for me, the, uh, the priorities are Europe uh, and the United States, but we also had some progress uh, during the quarter uh, in other geographies. And here it's important to, to mention here we're talking about the device. Uh, so, so far the drug is only, uh, only approved in, in Europe, but we're trying to expand the use of the device also in, in, in other geographies. We did get approval for uh, Turkey and Argentina. Uh, both of them are sizable countries, sizable, uh, sizable potential markets. And we've also filed for marketing authorization in China uh, and also in Brazil, uh, which, which especially the addition of Brazil is, is uh, interesting for us because uh, that is going to be the same distributor that's already quite successful in, in Mexico and Colombia. And if you followed us for a while, these countries actually did come up as the second lar largest markets in some quarters after, after Germany. So it's an important area for, uh, for us. 
On the supply side, uh, we, are, we are also quite active, uh, running a dual sourcing uh, project, which is intended to reduce our dependency on individual suppliers. Uh, we are producing most of our medical devices in Asia today, and not just since COVID, but COVID has made it a bit worse, of course, shipping from Asia uh, to, to Europe. Uh, is quite expensive and not not free of risks either. So we are we are uh, working on uh, establishing a second source of uh, of supply for our main products. We've already started up production in the European Union for uh, the Sedaconda syringes, which is an important accessory. Um, uh, every patient needs two to three of those every uh, every day on top of the main uh, main uh, main product. Uh, and of course, the aim is to add step by step, add more products uh, to that dual sourcing uh, project over time. Yeah, that brings me to the end of the, uh, uh, the, the presentation. Uh, I hope I could give you a little bit of an impression that this is an exciting time for us. Uh, we are just about uh, to, to enter the, the, the hot phase of the, of the launch, so a lot of things are happening at the same time, progress in the US as well. So very exciting time for us, and I'm uh, looking for, uh, forward to any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, very interesting presentation, and I can fully understand why you're excited <laughs> about the opportunities for the company. Uh, let's dwell back to the paradigm shift, uh, mm -hmm. which attracts me a lot of, of the advantages in using your product for, for the physician, is obviously the lower opioid requirements. I think a lot of investors are fairly unfamiliar with uh, the, the environment in an ICU ward. Could you explain why that is important? Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, I mean, the, uh, that's uh, that's important for uh, for several reasons. So, uh, if if you think about the uh, the ICU as an environment, which of course is a very kind of hectic, hectic, high stress, uh, high stress environment, uh, and patients by definition are. Uh, critically ill, uh, you will often see that these patients get a lot of different drugs, uh, and opioids is, is very open, uh, often one uh, one of them. Uh, there's different types of uh, of opioids because a lot of these patients obviously are in in, in pain. Um, now, apart from the fact that there's a, 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 it's generally good to have less drugs used in in a single uh, in a single patient. Opioids specifically um, have. Uh, several effects uh, that make life in the ICU even even more difficult than it is uh, is anyway. For, first of all, opioids suppress the respiratory uh, system, uh, so people have even more problems uh, uh, breathing. If you've probably heard, if somebody has an opioid overdose, they will stop breathing, uh, have a respiratory failure. Now here we're talking about patients that are mechanically ventilated, so need help breathing. So the less opioids uh, you use, the, the better, of course, for the for these patients. But then there's also um, uh, other effects of opioids, like for example, uh, they prolong uh, the sedation, so it will be even more uh, more difficult for them to uh, to wake up. Uh, they will also lead to um, complications with constipation, for example, which if you have a patient that is lying in the bed is anyway a big problem for for for, for the patient, but also for the staff in the in the ICU. And if you can reduce that, uh, that uh, that is of course a big big plus. And and what's uh, what's quite significant about these findings is these patients needed 30% less opioids, but at the same time the pain was not was not more severe, so we're not giving them less opioids at the patient's expense. The patient is as uh, as, um, as as well managed from a pain perspective as as, as with intravenous sedation, but it's just uh, a, a big advantage of using less of that. Uh, turning, uh, you, you mentioned Nice or, or the UK market, and I mm -hmm. think once again, uh, I think a lot, at least Swedish domestic investors are unfamiliar with Nice, and, and also that. The UK is very much in the forefront when it comes to cost containment within healthcare. C can you explain a bit, because it's quite stunning figures which you yeah. have from NICE. Can you explain what NICE actually does and, and uh, how it can affect uh, users, not just in the UK, but also in the rest of the world? C could you please elaborate on, on, on that? Please. Yes. No. Of course. So in 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 the UK, we have uh, we have basically uh, two processes that that we're running in the same time. One is just getting the the drug approved. That works with the MHRA, so the national authorities that approve uh, uh, approve the drugs. That that process is still ongoing. We're expecting the approval during uh, during this year. What Nice is doing, uh, they are looking at different medications and and, and therapies, and are trying to issue guidances, uh, which is uh, are then intended uh, to help healthcare professionals, uh, first of all, to 
apply good medicine, uh, but at the same time also keep uh, keep cost in uh, under control. Uh, and what they have done uh, with our therapy is they have, and this is a very, very thorough uh, assessment, they have taken more than a year uh, to look into this. They have looked at all available in evidence for inhaled sedation, including our own uh, clinical trial, but overall they looked at 21 uh, uh, clinical clinical trials. And they also do a lot of cost modeling. So in our, um, our case, what they have done is they've looked at a post hoc analysis uh, that was based on our clinical trial, where they compared patients that only got propofol and patients that only got our therapy. And if you compare those, there was a four-day difference uh, in terms of how quickly uh, patients could leave the intensive care unit. And that, of course, since the ICU is the most expensive setting that you have in, an, in, a, in a hospital, that leaves, leads to a, a very significant saving. But they also looked at very practical things, like, for example, nurse time. How much time does a nurse take to switch out the propofol bag every couple of hours versus uh, changing our disposables every 24 hours? And, and adding these effects up, uh, they came to this 3,800-pound saving uh, per patient if you look over a 30-day um, uh, um, uh, period, which is of course for us uh, a very good outcome uh, because um, we can now take this to customers and it is not something that we have cooked up ourselves. Look, we have made an Excel sheet and we think we, you, can, you can save something, but it's actually a, a very reputable F institution in, in the UK that everybody uh, in the pharma and, and healthcare world knows um, that has, has confirmed these findings and that, that's a very good outcome for us. Very interesting. The the opportunity in the U.S. is immense, and and we see you you have a, a very clear cut and, and uh, uh, in my view a, a very good way of, of addressing the U.S. market. However, investors are quite familiar with the regulatory issues surrounding these type of companies. Could you in more detail uh, outline the regulatory pathway in the mm -hmm. U.S. so so investors understand? Yep. where you are and where you're heading. Yes, so we have we have aligned on a regulatory pathway and a clinical program with the with the FDA. Uh, so we are quite um, certain what we need to deliver. Not saying that it's not a lot of work, uh, but we know what to do. Uh, and uh, and the pathway is uh, what's called a 505B2 pathway. It's a drug device combination. 505B2 means uh, that you don't have to start from scratch, uh, but since isoflurane, the, the drug is approved in the US for use in the operating theater, not yet in the ICU, but in the operating theater, there's certain data uh, that is already in existence and that we can bridge to, meaning we can use for the, for the, for the dossier. So we don't have to start from, uh, from scratch, as you would have to do with a completely new chemical entity, uh, but there's something to build on. The main element that we still have to do is a clinical program. Uh, it's a study, or essentially, actually it's two equivalent studies with a total of 500, uh, 500 patients. And of course, a clinical trial is never completely risk-free. We've uh, unfortunately seen that uh, with, with uh, different companies, also, also from Sweden recently. Um, what gives me a lot of confidence is we have run more or less the same trial uh, in Europe, and we had very good results. Uh, so we did show that inhaled sedation is as good as uh, propofol from a pure sedation perspective, but we have shown superiority in things like wake-up times and opioid use, as we talked about, and, and spontaneous uh, breathing. So never a zero-risk thing to do this, but we're very happy that FDA more or less um, uh, um, uh, accepted the same setup that we've already done in, in Europe. There's some small practical differences, for example, in how we need to do the blinding uh, and, uh, and what covers to put where and so forth, but the endpoints are essentially the same, which gives me a lot of hope that we will hopefully uh, see the same benefits again. Now turning to the pandemic or COVID, mm -hmm. uh, that, that has distorted a lot <laughs> for all companies, but for uh, life science companies in, in particular, uh, yeah. for some companies there's been an opportunity, for others obviously uh, uh, not so much. Uh, could you, now when we are looking at hopefully going to the end of the pandemics, uh, where would you say Sedana is positioned for post-COVID, mm -hmm. turning to, to, to that aspect of, of your sales? Yeah, so uh, COVID is a bit of a double-edged sword for us because on the on the one hand, uh, you had a period now over two years where you had more 
patients in the ICU that needed mechanical ventilations. We are selling a solution for mechanically ventilated patients. So they're, they're, they're in the countries where we uh, where we uh, have a presence, like Germany, we, we rose a bit with the with the tide. Um, at the same time, uh, it also makes access to hospitals much more difficult. Uh, so it's more difficult for our field teams to be in the intensive care unit and, and work with the, uh, with the customers. So the effects we've seen from COVID is uh, it opened uh, uh, more, more uh, kind of. Uh, first of all, it put us on the map, so more, more people uh, became aware of uh, aware of us. Uh, we we were um, starting up new hospitals because they were forced to. Maybe there was no uh, no uh, propofol around. Uh, uh, but the, the very positive effect of that is that we then saw that once the the uh, customer saw that this uh, this therapy actually works, uh, we saw the use expand to other patient groups as well. Uh, so it was not just COVID patients, but then also your pneumonia patients. Your Surgery patients, your uh, your multiple organ failure patients, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and that I think has put us on a on a on a better level, better platform for the for the launch. But of course, um, uh, Sedana was never built to be a COVID company, uh, so we are not planning for uh, our our sales are not dependent on on the next COVID uh, wave coming. Of course, we are, we are we are trying to bring a solution for all uh, mechanically ventilated uh, uh, patients. Going back to your market. Place, so to say. I mean, the ICU is a very specific, mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a, a very peculiar place to be. But what we do have there is is very professional and highly educated physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when they see something which is favorable, they they tend to go towards that product or or, or whatever it is. If if you look if, when you talk to ICU physicians. What do they? What is the feedback you get from them yep. once they've started to use your product? Yeah, so I'm relatively new in the role. I started in October, so I used that luxury of being out there as much as I could uh, and uh, be present in these ICUs. I think I visited several dozens of ICUs in, in different uh, in different countries, uh, and that gave me a lot of confidence uh, because when you speak to physicians that are using our products. Uh, of course, they intellectually understand the clinical trials that have been run, but they also say, I do see a difference in the patients that I'm, uh, I'm caring for every day, which by definition is, is very critically ill, Ill patients. Uh, and that's very important, uh, uh, important for me. It still means, of course, uh, that we have a lot of work to do uh, because what we are asking for is a change of behavior. Propofol has been around for, for a very, very long time. Uh, every nurse can uh, do a propofol infusion in their sleep. They've done it thousands of times. And in a, as you say yourself, in a, in a high pace and stressful in, um, situation like the ICU, there's always a reason to fall back to what you're used to. So when you're bringing something new, uh, if our, our, our teams have to spend a lot of time to make this a routine right from the start and, and train the ICU staff, be there for a couple of days when the patient comes in, help them set up, answer all the questions, make them, uh, make them familiar. And what, ho what helps us a lot is all the people that we have out in the field are former ICU nurses. Uh, so we hire people from, uh, from intensive care units who know that environment uh, and know how to speak to other nurses, know how to speak to, uh, to physicians, because they come with a completely different credibility. Uh, because as you can imagine, in an ICU, the tolerance for salespeople uh, only trying to deliver a sales message and, and st uh, standing in the way, not knowing their stuff, is very, very low. Uh, and there, there, I think we have a big advantage with our people very, being very qualified just from a medical perspective because all of them have worked as a nurse before. A, a bit twist on that sort of from a geographical perspective. Do you see any difference, let's say, between a uh, German ICU physician and a, a US one? Are there any differences how, how they view your product? Yeah, it's not just between Germany and the US. It's uh, it's there's there's big differences between countries in general uh, how ICUs are run. Uh, so, for example, in the in the in the US, you have a special type of nurse that we don't even have in uh, in uh, in, um, in in Europe. It's not even called a nurse; a respiratory therapist who's who's responsible for only the ventilator and everything that uh, is has to do with the respiratory tract of the uh, of the uh, of the patient. That role, for example, does not exist in in uh, in in Europe. But you also have differences like 
Sometimes you have an ICU run by an anesthesiologist uh, that also works in the operating theater. Then uh, the step of introducing gas to the intensive care unit is, is uh, usually not very complicated because they're used to working with gas in the, in the operating theater. If you have a unit that is run by an intensivist who doesn't work with the gas, you probably need to spend more time uh, to get them comfortable with a, a, a slightly different setup uh, and make them comfortable with, uh, with the gas uh, use in the, uh, in the ICU. So there is differences uh, which uh, we have to be very, very aware of and, and we also of course have to tailor our commercial approach depending on these differences. Well, uh, I don't have any further questions. No, I, I really want to thank you uh, for, for a very interesting uh, presentation of a, of a very interesting company. Uh, thank you for coming to Panzer. Thank you very thank much you. for having me and thanks thank for the questions. Thanks.